What is up, players? It's Warboss Tay up in its mode. Welcome to part one of my painting tutorial on how to paint Wolfric the Wanderer for Warhammer Fantasy Battles. I am just gonna continue on that vein and not even mention the possibility of using him for Age of Sigmar because he belongs in Warhammer Fantasy. So the colors we're gonna be using are Castellan Green, Lead Belcher, Balthazar Gold, Rackarth Flesh, Xandri Dust, Bugman's Glow, Rhinox Hide, Nagaroth Knight, Screamer Pink, Celestra Gray, Mornfang Brown, Known Oil, Agrax Earthshade, Drukai Violet, Brakeland Flesh Shade, Dark Reaper. And uh, this is going to take us all the way up to here. He's a little bit shiny now because I just finished filming him getting the washes put on. So once those dry, it will uh, get pretty matte. And as you can see, I'm just cleaning up some of the pools of wash around him. Want to make sure we don't have any any puddles that are going to dry uh, negatively. So let's get started. The first thing I did was prime my model in black after I built him up in the last video. And uh, I missed some areas though. That shield is so big, it kind of covers his left side. So I, I went in with some Abaddon Black and I turned the model all around at all different angles to make sure that I got that black painted everywhere just to get all those shadows in. So now that our model is ready to go, you want to give your model a little bit of time after uh, cleaning up those shadows and definitely after you prime your model. I usually let my models sit outside for a good couple hours, make sure you don't get any of that chemical um, smell and vapors following you back into the house. You want to make sure you're in a well-ventilated area while you're painting and especially while you're spraying. I just got an airbrush recently and I'm gonna make sure that the doors are open and the fan is going and um, yeah I just don't want to get any lightheadedness or any weirdness from that. So Rackarth Flesh is the first color we're going to be using and uh, the reason I wanted to do that is because even with Rackarth Flesh being as thick as it is, there sometimes is a tendency when you're thinning down your paint to see that it kind of spreads and doesn't provide very very good coverage, especially over a black primer. So by using Rackarth Flesh first, we get this tricky color kind of laid down and then later on while we're painting up other colors, the Rackarth flesh will dry, and then we'll be able to see, oh, on this skull you can kind of see the black primer peeking through, or, uh, you know, something like that. So then you can go back and clean that up, rather than saving until the very end. It's just a personal preference though, you can really go in any order you want with any of these. The um, For you beginner painters out there, the, the standard way of painting a model is you put in the base, put on the base colors which is the uh, thickest, strongest colors, and um, usually if you're going with Games Workshop paints, the foundation or base colors are of a thicker pigment consistency, which means that it will, it, supposedly it's going to cover better than a layer paint, which is a little bit thinner and meant to be added as highlight colors. <clears throat> and um, after the base coats you shade or glaze your model and then you come back and you highlight it. So right now for the base colors, the model you might have seen um, when I looked it up online, I hadn't realized that he's in silver armor. For some reason I always think that Chaos Warriors or Warriors of Chaos in the fantasy setting are in black armor with the gold trim and I guess these guys are in uh, silver armor, or Wolfric is in silver armor with gold trim. So that's pretty cool. 
I'm really just looking for all of the bones and uh, bone kind of surfaces. So he's got this, what, what I assume is either an ogre or a, or a large black orc. Actually, it has a corn symbol on its head, which I just noticed. So um, maybe a chaos troll. But anyways, it's a skull, or the front half of a skull that's been uh, lashed to his right shoulder shoulder pad. Skulls all over this guy. Like I said, his um, his fluff is that he was a chaos warrior that was really good at what he did which is, you know, pillaging and killing and slaughtering innocent people and even formidable warriors. He just went around killing everybody. And uh, one night he got so drunk at a party, he said, I can defeat anyone, anyone in the whole world and even the gods. And the chaos gods did not like that. So they cursed him to wander the world and uh, fight people that they commanded him to fight. And that means in the game it translates to him supposedly being really good at challenges because he didn't waste time with uh, weaker prey. He would look for the biggest, strongest champions that the Chaos Gods would order him to attack and he would uh, allegedly be really good at killing them. So I, I like his story. They also, be, um, in, in return for this, in exchange for that, they blessed him with all these great powers and uh, very very strong fat he's very strong he's very fast he had quick reflexes but um, yeah the curse was that he could never settle down um, he would never be happy if he was not always fighting so uh, his his main goals in life when he was just a warrior of chaos was he wanted to have glory and be the chieftain of his own tribe and uh, and then like have have you know be set for life have a very comfortable life after that and just get whatever he wanted because of his his strength and his might. Uh, but then he's cursed now. He'll never stay in one place. He's that's why he's called Wolfric the Wanderer. He's always going to be traveling and doing the gods' bidding. And I think that's that's great. It's the uh, that whole hubris of uh, man arrogance coming back to uh, to bite him in the butt. Okay, I'm gonna apologize again. I thought I had stopped, uh, set the F stop on my camera and uh, gotten the macro setting going. And, and it worked a little bit better, so the, the camera does pick up a little bit faster when it goes out of focus. But there are some times when, I don't know if I was aiming the camera too high or I just kind of got so into the painting that I, uh, I'm doing what you can see here. I'm slowly, slowly moving to, um, towards the left of the table or underneath the camera and it's not able to focus it. So uh, don't look at your computer screen or your TV screen if you've got this going on the TV screen. Don't don't focus on it too much because uh, I noticed in the playback unfortunately that the uh, focus is a little janky. I think it also doesn't help that I'm painting on a cardboard covered table and the model that I'm trying to paint is uh, all black right now just about all black with this bone color going on I think uh, it's having a hard time focusing on that as well I don't know I could, I could be totally wrong so then I'm painting him and his skin I think later on I realized I'd rather have him be kind of pink and fleshy and kind of create that, that contrast so uh, that's gonna change but for now that's what we're doing. Okay, Xandri Dust is our next color. I think one of his, his rules in the game, uh, at least in the last edition of Warhammer Fantasy, was he had this magical longship that could just appear wherever he chose. It would just come out of the warp, like he was using a warp drive, and it would pop up uh, wherever you wanted it to. And so in the, in the game, it would show up on the battlefield and you could you know, flank or or you know, attack the rear of your enemy's army. And for uh, the fluff and the fiction, I think there was a book written about about Wolfric. Actually, for for the book, the way he gets it is that uh, he's led to it. 
either by the chaos gods or, or a rumor or something, and then um, he has to fight and kill a witch to get this long ship. And then him and his men, once they once they do that, then they're able to take the long ship and just dive into the warp and come out wherever they want. And it's like um, very reminiscent of the way starships in the 40k universe travel. They just dive into the warp and they pop out wherever they want. Hopefully, sometimes they get lost forever, but that's the that's another cool thing about 40k fiction. With Xandri Dust, basically what I'm trying to do is paint all of the little bindings, the, the little string, and um, I, I guess wiring, I don't know what else you would call it, except that uh, the string that is tying all of the skulls to his trophy rack and all over his, his body. So uh, you see that a lot coming out of the, the eye sockets of the skulls. And usually, if they're hanging, then it's you know coming up from the top of their skull, and then it it's got two little threads going into each eye socket. Yeah, but one of the things they also mention, I think, in the book is that he can he can talk in any language. They give him the the gift of tongues, or the, I think they call it the curse of tongues or something. The chaos gods let him speak in any language, but I think it's something like he can only shout challenges in them, so he couldn't use it for for any other purpose, I think. I could be getting that wrong, but I think that's such an interesting thing that he can speak and understand any language, but the only thing he can really communicate is challenges. <laughs> That, that would be horrible. That'd be a horrible gift to have in a bar. Or anywhere where you don't speak the language. Like a Disneyland or something. And, like, I want to go to ride uh, the Indiana Jones ride. But then when I ask a Disney worker, it comes out like, Come at me, bro. I'm gonna kick your butt. I hate Mickey. Man, I love Disneyland. I wish I could go back there. So you can see we're moving on to the lead belcher now. So this is all the silver bits. I'm starting with the sword and I'm going to get to the armor. He's got chainmail. You can see he's got some chainmail hanging down and also coming down off of the plate mail under his shoulder pads, he's got a chainmail shirt, chainmail sleeves coming down to his gloves. So that's going to get silver as well. And I think I'm starting from the bottom. So right above his boots, he's got those knee pads and uh, his full plate mail armor we're painting silver. And then we're going to get the shield as well. So here's a beginner technique that I always like to stress in my videos. Uh, as much as I can, what I like to do is paint the largest surface, or the uh, the most prominent features or colors first. And uh, in this case, it's all the bone, right? The skulls and all of the bone fragments and teeth and um, everything like that. And then once that's done, I try to start from the inside. The, the innermost layer of the model and work my way out. So the silver has gold trim on the armor. If I painted the gold trim first and then I try to paint the silver afterwards, one thing that one danger would be that um, as I'm turning my model around to paint, the silver on my brush could get uh, accidentally put onto the uh, areas that I had already painted gold. By painting from the inside, so in this case I'm trying to paint the chainmail sleeves, I'm um, getting the inner flat part of each shoulder plate, 
and uh, if I make any mistakes, like if I paint the trimming in silver, that's okay because I'm right about to cover it up when I move on to my next step. So that's uh, something that actually took me a while to learn because I always wanted to start from from the, the top layers or the most outer layers and work my way in. And uh, man, I was such a stubborn painter when I began. I think somebody saw me doing that and they said, why are you painting like that? You're having to redo everything that you just did. And I had no answer except that that's just how I did it. And finally one day I tried doing it like this and it was... It was so much easier. So next we're moving on to Balthazar Gold and we're going to be hitting all the trimming on the armor as well as I think he's got a, a sword pommel that's going to be in gold. Or the hilt, rather, the hilt, not the pommel. The pommel's the bottom. And the shield. Okay, so while I was painting the Balthazar Gold, you might not be able to see it, but it's spreading very, very much. And uh, when I was sitting in my paint pot, the medium and the gold pigment kind of separated. So when I dipped my paintbrush into the pot and even when I put it onto my wet palette, unfortunately it was already, there, there wasn't that much gold pigment in the paint. So it's, it's spreading, it's kind of getting onto the silver a little bit. And uh, that just goes to show, before you use each new color, give it a good shake and get the pigment mixing with the medium. Now, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do this, but there's no edging for the shield on the back side, which is strange because there's a trim on the front of the shield, but on the back there isn't one. So I'm just taking it upon myself to paint the side, the outer edges of the shield, and leaving the back in silver. Now here again, I'm, I'm trying to find the angle to paint the trim of the shield so that if you're looking down at the model, you can see the trim is obviously in gold and the, the main part is in silver. But uh, because it is kind of spreading already and uh, it's not mixed well, that gold paint is getting onto the silver. There is a little chaos star on his left shoulder pad, or one half of a chaos star, actually. And now we're working on the back side on the shoulder pad. Now I'm just getting the uh, trimming underneath each shoulder pad. There's, uh, it's interesting because there's a series of plates under the main shoulder pad, and each of those plates has gold trimming on it. So that's what I'm painting under the skull. You can see there, there's a little bit of, of a plate peeking out from the main shoulder pad or shoulder plate. And then there's the rim of the shoulder pad at the top. So you can see that I'm using a cork handle to, or a mount to put my model on. I used to hold my models from the bases. I would glue them into the base and hold them from the base. And I think that kind of messed up my fingers and my, my hand a little bit. So I find it much easier now to use this cork um, mount 
I guess, a big piece of cork that you put some blue tack on and then just stick your model on right after that. Unfortunately, at the end of the video, when we get into the shades, I, uh, I had tried filming a couple videos of applying the shades and <laughs> Wolfric, he was not having it. He just started falling off for some reason and he wouldn't stay on. So I had to kind of jump to the end of the shades application. Unfortunately, you kind of miss uh, the entirety of that, but I mean, that's, that's all right because applying shades is not a very, very uh, technical thing. Just kind of slap it on where you want it to go and make sure there's no puddles. Okay, Bugman's Glow. This is, I think, the most where I kind of am painting out of frame because I was so excited painting this flayed man. What? House Bolton? And uh, I, I think I just started moving him more and further, further and further to my left. And now he's gone. I think at some point I look up and I see the viewfinder of this camera and I realize, oh shoot, I am not in frame at all and I kind of move him up but until that happens I'm afraid there is no image really I'm um I, I remember painting it though and Bugman's Glow as great as it is it's another one of those colors that you're gonna need to put on multiple applications if you're painting it over a black primer oops I think I just looked up right there and I was like, oh, and that's why I did my hands. Ah! I'm so dumb. So I just uh, want to reiterate, if you're painting over black primer, uh, another technique to help you out to get good coverage and make sure you're not clumping your paint is that uh, I'm doing a lot of small, short brush strokes instead of just slapping the paint on and doing a few brush strokes to spread it around. What happens when you do that is you end up with some paint deposits that kind of dry, all clumpy, and uh, kind of ruins the details. If you put the paint down with the tip of your brush and just kind of spread it out using a bunch of multiple short strokes like that, then what will happen is that the paint will spread and the brush strokes will disappear. you just take that paint and you move it around. Later on I decided to do the skull um, as if it was just freshly maimed and so I do paint that in rack art flesh like the other skulls and bones but I noticed that poor dude still has his hair so um, that that was kind of hard for me to find okay where does the skull and and his scalp begin Now I'm painting the come at me bro hands on uh, his trophy rack there. Baby, give me a hug. I've missed you. I've missed you, baby. And I think this is also when I realized I, I think I want him to look a little bit more healthy and alive and pink. <laughs> now we're definitely going to be shading and highlighting him so he doesn't look like that. But uh, for now, it's pretty funny. Okay, for some reason I picked up Evil Sun Scarlet. Not even close to the color I was looking for. It was Castell and Green. I think when I filmed this, it, it was already four o'clock in the morning and I was on running on an hour of sleep or something. Gotta get these commissions done, son! So, uh, I don't know why Games Workshop painted his boots green. That's interesting choice. And if you look at his cover art, then you'll see that he's got uh, a purple sword strapped to his hip, a kind of reddish purple scroll case hanging from his body. He's a riot of colors. So now we're taking Mornfang Brown and we're gonna 
lay down the, the base work for his mohawk and beard. It reminds me of a troll slayer, that mohawk and beard combination. Man, my lady boss does not care for for uh, beards. I used to grow them. Well, not really grow them. I I can't really grow a beard, but I used to grow grow myself a little patchy scruffiness. I used to think it was pretty awesome. Like I was in a post-apocalyptic future, and I was a little scruffy, and a couple days without a shave. And then you know, when you shave, it's like nice and clean and smooth. And uh, yeah, once I started dating the lady boss a couple of years ago, she was like, I do not like beards. And I was like, I don't like them either. <laughs> Reminds me of that meme. It says, um, I don't like cats. My girlfriend likes cats. So we compromised and got a cat. <laughs> and she's not my girlfriend anymore. She's my fiance. I proposed to her, so... The lady boss uh, usually gets her way, which is nice because then she lets me paint and she supports me as a commission artist, so it works out for everybody. What did I do? I painted his mustache. Don't forget he's got a mustache, so you can uh, hit that up with Mornfang Brown. Now the Rhinox hide is going to be used not only for his gloves, but also for the wood of his trophy racks. And uh, don't forget the, the little cross. So now most of the base coat colors have been laid down, on, at least on the front of the model. We haven't gotten to the cloaks yet, but um, when, when we're looking at the model now, at, at this point, this is what I would call the uh, time of painting when you start looking at the model and finding the details that you missed. So I'm uh, gonna go to Screamer Pink, and uh, this is gonna be used to paint the what I, what I think is a scroll case hanging off of his armor there. And it's interesting, when you look at the Games Workshop official model that the Heavy Metal team painted, it's like this very dark and um, subdued color of purple. But uh, when, when I was thinking of well, what am I going to be painting it as a base color, the only really logical step would be to start brighter and then shade it down to what that color is going to be. So I'm looking at the model actually right next to me, dried, and uh, it looks good. So Screamer Pink is going to be that scroll case. Now we're moving on to Nagaroth Knight. And Nagaroth Knight is going to be the color that we're going to paint the holster, the scabbard, and uh, most of the, the, the hilt of the dagger that he's got on his left hip there. And I really love this aesthetic of the model, this part of the model, because it is a curved dagger that is obviously not from the old world, uh, the, the European side of the Warhammer Fantasy universe, but it looks very, uh, like, different, like it's from a different culture, and uh, it, like somewhere from, I'm trying to remember what those two countries are named in the, in the fictional setting, I think Ind and Cathay are the two countries in the Warhammer world and I think those are supposed to represent like India and I'm not sure what Cathay is, China maybe? But uh, it's it was great of the sculptors to include that in the model because it shows that Wolfric really has been everywhere. So once you paint the purple on, I did some of the details in Lead Belcher and now we're going to move on to Zandri Dust. At this point I am really just cleaning what I have already done. So I'm looking for any parts of the model that looks like they got painted over incorrectly or uh, the majority of the skulls, you know, have, like I said, those wires coming through the eyeballs or um, attaching it to his belt and to his body. So I'm just going back in now and finding those areas that I might have missed. The lashing 
of the uh, material that's holding the bones to his cape. Yeah, the, um, going back to the dagger, the, the Warhammer world is so huge and it is so vast that th there was enough potential there to do so so much with the with the fiction and the setting and i think a lot of it they didn't really get into and everybody was kind of well, maybe not everybody but a lot of people that i was uh, reading posts on forums and stuff they were kind of saying you know when, when are we going to get a more of a look at the nippon or the J japan side of the world steel legion drab now is what we're going to use to paint the back of the cloak and are saying like when are we going to look at the uh, india or Ind, Cathay, Estalia, uh, Tilia, all of the other countries that are mentioned in the fluff and the fiction and you kind of draw parallels to real world countries because of the names and um, there was so much potential there to, to do interesting things and a lot of people who make fluffy uh, converted armies now kind of use that. I saw this great Ogre Kingdoms army a while back that uh, the, the painter had sculpted and made a display base for them and one, made them look like they were from Cathay, which, or not Cathay, but uh, Nippon. So there, it, it had a very like Japanese um, look to it. There were cherry blossom trees and the ogres were dressed as samurai and uh, ninjas and stuff and it looked really, really cool. And I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if Games Workshop started releasing supplementary kits for that? And I know they did with the Dogs of War expansion from a couple editions back. They released these metal models that were sculpted to look like um, travelers of, around the world and uh, fighting mercenary bands. And I just wish that there was more of that, you know? That would have been so cool to have on the tabletop as, as separate factions. So you don't just have... Uh, Empire and Bretonia, but you've got uh, Nipponese samurai and Cathay uh, warriors. I thought that would have been a, a, a great opportunity, but I guess with Warhammer Fantasy just getting too big for its britches and not really making back the money and kind of relying on 40k to sustain the company, Games Workshop said let's let's not go in that direction and expand the world, but let's uh, blow it all up. And Age of Sigmar, it, it's just sad. Xandru Dust, again, we're using for all of the wire string material. So um, I'm painting the, the scroll, the hanging scroll. You saw on the back, he's got that brown steel beaten drab cape. And uh, I'm, I'm painting it that way, but I might, if you take a look at the cape itself, he's got like three different capes on his back. He's got that sea dragon cloak. He has uh, what looks like a wolf fur one. And then uh, this third one, like right over his right shoulder, that looks like it's to be made of a separate fur. So um, what I'm thinking of doing is painting that third one up as a leopard print, kind of like the... Um, Gosh, what's it called? Saber tusks that I did a couple years back. If you remember the saber tusk tutorial, I painted them to look like they had little leopard spots, or was it? No, it was something else. It was my savage orcs. I'm sorry, from a long time ago, that uh, I painted some of their pelts to look like they had leopard spots or black spots on a orangish kind of hide. So I'm taking Rakarth flesh now, and I'm painting the back or the the inner lining of the sea dragon cloak. And the reason I chose Rakarth Flesh for that is because I wanted to show that it was um, it was a different it was a different material, and so it's going to be a different uh, color because it's a smooth texture. So it's just the the inner part of the cloak there. Yeah, this guy really has been all around the world, and I I love that they tried to show that with the curved dagger, the different kinds of uh, skulls hanging off of his back and off of his armor, and then the different cloaks he's got. He's gone all around and it's just collecting as he goes. I thought it was an interesting choice for them also to do his hair and his beard the way they did. It's almost reminiscent of a dwarf troll slayer with the mohawk and the, the bushy beard. Okay, so now I'm lining the hilt of the sword with the, uh, the, the handguard. 
using Balthazar Gold now and I'm just really cleaning up any of the areas. The great thing about having a core candle like this is you get to really turn it around and see all the angles on your models. Alright, moving along. And we're going to paint the actual Sea Dragon Cloak itself with Dark Reaper. So um, I'm going to be painting all of the scales and then later on we're going to shade it with Drukai Violet. And I decided to go with purple instead of blue because instead of bringing out the, the blue or, or bringing up the blue kind of shade of the cloak, what we're doing is shading it with that dark purple so that we can kind of do a co color transition. So that you see the Dark Reaper up at the top of the scales, but then there's like this rich, deep purple in all of the crevices. I thought that would be an interesting thing to look at. So you can really paint this Sea Dragon cloak any way you want. There's no 360 view of Wolfric, so it could be a red dragon cape or cloak. It could be, you know, anything you want. There's a little edging to the armor there on the back, right behind his head, so I painted that in steel, uh, Balthazar Gold, rather. Now I'm going to be painting the hair on the head of the Flayed Man on the shield with Celestia Grey. And the reason for this is because I think it would be interesting, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the fluff is, if there really is an like a little bit of fiction or background that explains who this poor person is on his shield, but I, I think an interesting uh, bit of fluff for for that would be that this um, is an old, old man or older gentleman who uh, Wolfric fought and maybe had some great power, like he was a chieftain of his tribe or he was a, a, a wizard and so Wolfric thought you, uh, this guy that he had defeated had such great power that he wanted to <laughs> keep his entire, um, like, upper body and skin draped on, on his person rather than just, just his skull. So he took his skull along with most of his skin. I think it, it would make more sense if it was like a wizard and his whole body was imbued with magical energy. See, that's something in the Warhammer world that, uh, the new, or the newer Warhammer didn't really get right except for a couple of instances like this. A lot of the new, the, the latest Warhammer models and uh, fiction and stuff have been geared towards let's sell bigger models, let's go and try to try to make some money and so they create things like the, the phoenixes for the high elves or the, the, those sky chariots or the, the giant chaos monster with the sword in its back, whatever that was called, the mutilith. They just wanted to keep going bigger and bigger and um, a lot of things that made the Warhammer world so great was that it was that low fantasy setting where um, you had a lot of uh, a lot of the threat of magic and stuff, but it was a lot of just grim darkness. Okay, so at this point, I've already added the shades, Known Oil and Agrax Earth Shade. I had actually wanted to film putting all of that on the model, but Wolfric just kept falling off of his mount. So um, I decided, you know, it kept going out of focus. It just wasn't good. So for the majority of the model I painted in Agrax Earthshade and Non Oil that mixed to create that dark shade. I did the, the Sea Dragon Cloak in Drukai Violet. Like I said, you can see how that turned out. I, I actually painted the skull of the Flayed Man in Rackard Flesh because it looks like the skull has been cleared out and or has been kind of like scalped and then the rest of his skin like the back of his head is uh, still attached to his skin so uh, I wanted to create a little color difference there and now we're going with Raiklin flesh shade over the rest of the skin on his body once that dries we'll highlight it back up um, but I think I did Wolfric's skin I shaded that with Agrax earth shade and non oil so uh, this is just really a little bit of pink shading and we're also going to do the hands on the come at me bro skeleton and uh, that should be it and I'm also going to paint his, his head as well there's also that hand don't forget there's a hand hanging off the back of his armor 
All right, and that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned for part two where we will add the highlights, and that's where we're really going to start getting into fine details, adding progressive highlights, and uh, making this special character really pop. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.